Greetings and salutations, my e-learning AP Human Geography students. This is Mr. Majewski here for our ceremonial inaugural first video lecture of the year. I'm fired up. I am ready to roll. Man, I sure hope you folks are as well. And we're going to begin at the beginning. I think there was a famous book written with some guy named Jesus that talked about that or something like that. But we're going to begin at the beginning with our very first inaugural video lecture on, you guessed it, maps, maps, and more maps. Woo! A.K. Projections. Projections. And more projections. Wow, I knew there was an exciting reason you took this class. I bet it was this. Let's get right into it. Map types, map styles, and thematic maps. We're going to cover all three of those. Bet you never knew there was a difference between a map type and a map style. Well, this is the video lecture for you. Uh, first off, anytime we look at a map, there are two reasons uh, why maps are created. Now, the one's the obvious. This is probably the one we're most familiar with, reference maps, right? They tell us how to get from one place to another. Anytime you're using Google Maps, anytime you're on your phone with the GPS, anytime you're looking at an actual hard copy of a map trying to figure out why you're lost or where you're supposed to go, that's a reference map. Those are cool. Those are important, right? I mean, obviously, we need to know where the heck we're going, but the other category is what we love. We heart this type of map in human geography. This is a thematic map. Uh, that tells us about the people in an area. It tells us about the behavior, their physical characteristics, or, or some other theme. Uh, and so we love these because we can analyze a place, we can analyze a group of people when we look at thematic maps. So those are the two general categories. Reference, we don't really use in this subject, but you probably use them in your everyday life a lot more. Thematic, that's what you got to learn, use to study and understand people and phenomenon happening in a place. So remember that, always two categories, we tend to focus on thematic. Now first, we're going to start with some famous world maps. These are maps that... Um, have been around for hundreds of years and um, in some instances. Uh, they're generally famous, they're widely used, these are the sort of maps you oftentimes see in textbooks. And I bet you never really realized that the world maps that we use have changed over time. And every one of them has some strengths and some weaknesses. Now let me get this out of the way right now, I'm going to talk about this in a later uh, presentation. Every map is inaccurate. There is no 100% accurate map in the world. You can't take a three-dimensional surface uh, like Earth and put it onto a two-dimensional flat surface without there being some stretch, without there being some pull, without there being some shrinkage, without there being some sort of error. Uh, and so, no map is accurate. In fact, every map you've ever seen is lying to you in some way. So let's get with the, uh, the most famous map that's out there, the most famous world map. It's called the Mercator map. Um, and it goes back hundreds of years to the early age of discovery. So this is a map that navigators use, sailors used, in order to navigate uh, around the world. This is like what the explorers were, were oftentimes kind of using or helped to create. Um, and it's obviously named after its creator. And uh, since it was important that... Uh, navigators used it and sailors used it. Um, they wanted to make sure that it was very accurate along, along the equator because that's where most of the um, traveling took place during this time. So it's very accurate right along the equator. But as you go further from the equator towards the edges, you start to get distortion. And the distortion with a Mercator map is stretch. And so what it, ha what it causes, uh, the phenomenon that it causes to take place is that locations further towards the outer edge are, are made much larger than they actually appear. So like Greenland right there, you look at Greenland, it's like 10 times larger than it actually is on this map, all right? You look at Africa, it's significantly smaller. If you can believe it, Africa is like six or seven times, almost 10 times larger than Greenland is in real life, right? You would never know that from the map. It looks the opposite. And that's because Greenland is towards the outer edges. Canada is stretched to make it look even larger than it actually is, all right? Consequently, uh, countries in the center, like Africa, or I should say continents like Africa, they tend to be more smushed together, and so they appear smaller. All right, so uh, the Mercator map, very famous. It is a cylindrical map. What I mean by that is if you open it up, check, check this out, you go back, you look at this rectangular map, right? You can roll it up into a cylinder and take it with you. 
That's what we mean by cylindrical map. So if they have this shape, they are considered cylindrical. Uh, and like I said, it was designed for sailors. There is incredible distortion, and remember that's another word for error. Um, the further south and north that you go, also the furthest extremes on the east and west of the map. Um, and so anytime you're looking at Mercator, you want to make sure that you really focus on Greenland and um, Africa. Uh, or focus on Brazil and Australia. Uh, because again, uh, 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 I should say Brazil and Alaska, Mr. Majewski, good lord, uh, because Alaska actually is stretched out and made to look much larger than it is in real life on this image because it's towards uh, the western edge of the map. All right, so lots of pull and stretch towards the outer edges. And you see these little dots right here? Those dots actually um, show you how much gap there is um, in between lines of latitude or longitude. And so do you notice how the circles get bigger as you go towards the outer edges? If we continued this, the next circles would be even larger up here. Uh, and what that's trying to show to you is, as the further you get to the edge, the further the stretch there is. Mercator map's important. It's probably in every history book you've ever seen, right? It's also probably the most inaccurate map that's out there. I mean, look at freaking Australia. Uh, what is my problem? Look at freaking Antarctica on this map. Uh, look at how stretched it is. Look at how elongated it is. And that's, again, a factor of it being at the bottom of the map itself. So we don't hate on Mercator because, I mean, it's been the map that the world has known for hundreds and hundreds of years. We just realize that if we want to make a map as accurate as possible, we probably have better options. And this is one of them. This is called the Peter's Projection. All right. Um, now, what the Peter's Projection does is it is the opposite of Mercator. It focuses on getting land area exact. So this is the actual land area sizes of locations on Earth. Look how much larger Africa is here. This is Africa's actual size. Alrighty. Compare it back to the Mercator map that we're looking at right here. It is just an enormous difference. Um, and so what Peters does is they say, hey, we want to fix Mercator because they're way off on land area. So why don't we make sure we get land area right? Now, what that means is there's other type of error here. There's, di there's error in, in terms of the distance between places. It's either more or less than it actually ought to be. Um, but what they focused on here is let's get the area right, and that's what Peter's projection does. Um, that's another Peter's map. It's a different way of looking at it, same sort of deal. It's also a cylindrical map. It's called equal area because the area, the land mass of these things is exactly right. So that's what they get right, but it does experience other types of distortion because remember, maps are a trade-off. They're never going to be 100% right. So if you focus on getting one area of it exact right, like land mass, then direction and distance and all these other things are going to be off. Um, you know, Peters is generally like considered a an attack on the Mercator projection, um, and we'll watch some videos on this a little bit later. More recently, we have this. It's called the Robinson projection. This is considered by many to be the ideal map today. Uh, and the thing with Robinson is they... Uh, there are four major types of error or distortion on a map, right? And um, and you can never get rid of all of those. So what Robinson says is, hey, let's not eliminate any type of distortion, right? But let's try to get all four types of distortion as small as possible. So we call this a compromise map um, because it's you know it doesn't have land area exact, it doesn't have distance exact between two locations, it doesn't have the direction or the facing exact, right? Um, it doesn't have shape always exact. But what they've decided to do is uh, is try to minimize the error as much as possible in all four of those, um, recognizing that they don't have any one of those four areas exactly right. They try to minimize the distortion in all four. So it's a compromise. It's basically like, eh, this is the best that we can do um, in trying to eliminate as much of the four types of error that is possible. Again, minimize area, shape, distance, and direction errors so the map looks as close as possible to Earth, right? Uh, more recently, it's been replaced by something called the mole-wide projection, uh, which has become much, much more popular in modern times, and that's because National Geographic has switched over to that since the 1980s. This is the mole-wide projection. It's basically like the new version of the Robinson, all right? Uh, so if you want to call Robinson and mole-wide kind of the same, that's fine, because they're... Um, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the things they are work. They, uh, Mowide was developed to kind of build on or add on to Robinson and try to reduce the error even further. 
Uh, azimuthal maps are maps that focus on one point on Earth. Usually it's the North or the South Pole. And then they look at Earth just from that pole. Now, it's called a planner map uh, because it's creating a plane uh, of study. Uh, a flat surface, a flat area. Now, what Azumathal does, by focusing on the north or the south pole, you're really able to see that hemisphere in great detail. The problem is, um, it you really can't see the southern hemisphere if you're focused on the north pole, or vice versa. So it really gives you an impartial, incomplete, almost like a half view of Earth. Um, it's really popular with pilots, since a lot of the times it makes sense for planes to travel over the poles to shorten the distance on international flights. A lot of international pilots will use Azumathal, they're very familiar with it, um, because it will decrease flight times, uh, depending on the path that a pilot takes. Uh, and then the bottom one. This has now become one of the more popular styles, the most modern. It's called the Goods Interrupted Homosaline uh, Map, and what it does is it takes the best of the mole-wide projection, and then it cuts out areas uh, where nobody lives, right? Since human geographers like to study people and where they are distributed, studying parts in the ocean that don't have anybody really doesn't help us, isn't effective. And so Goods Interrupted uh, has taken that mole-wide projection and then they've cut out the parts where nobody lives so that you can really just focus on the areas that have permanent human settlement. All right, so that's your historic map types, right? Um, you know, you've got, you've got Mercator, you've got Peters, you've got Robinson, you got Molewide. Azimuthal, you just need to know. We're not really going to use that very often. And Goods, yeah, that's just really cutting out like slices of an orange, the parts of the ocean that don't have anybody living in that spot. Okay. So those are some of the famous world maps. Those would be reference maps, right? Uh, because they're telling us where countries are located. But remember, there's a whole other category, and that's where we want to focus. These are thematic maps, and I'm going to go pretty quickly with these. Please pay attention. Um, thematic maps tell us um, a theme about a particular area. Again, it could be the people, the place, the physical characteristics, right? We want to look at religion in areas, right? We want to look at the culture. We want to look at ethnicity, language. We're going to look at thematic maps to see where those particular phenomenon exist and where they don't. Now, a lot of different ways to display these uh, thematic maps. You've got uh, a number of different varieties. Here they are listed, the six major ones that you need to know, but I'm going to tell you right now there are some others um, that are not on this particular list but are in the PowerPoint. So let's get to dot maps. Dot maps are a thematic map in which a dot is used to represent the frequency of whatever's being mapped. And each dot is going to re uh, represent one of those things that's being measured. So, pretty simple, right? If you see a bunch of dots uh, on a map, you know that's a dot map. Pretty easy to figure out. So, for instance, uh, this is a dot map that shows where commercial wireless antennas are located. So, you know, cell phone reception, you need those commercial wireless antenna. Uh, every dot on here indicates a spot where an antenna is located, and not surprisingly, they tend to be located in large cities where most people in the United States live. All right, and that helps to explain why when you travel through middle of nowheresville, Utah, for instance, uh, you know you you run out of cell phone service, right? Because you're not in an area where a tower is um, providing you some of that service. Here's another dot map, right, of Great Britain. Uh, and it's showing British sites that are being conserved, right, for historical or environmental reasons. So each dot is a different site. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, rentals in San Francisco. Red and blue dots here. Um, and uh, what the dots are representing is where renters are, right, versus where owners are at. Blue dots are homeowners, right? Red dots are more rental areas. Uh, and I think the whole point here is trying to show that um, in a lot of places in San Francisco, most people, because the prices are so high now, most people really can only afford to rent. They no longer can afford to buy homes. All right, so that's a dot map that's pretty easy. It was like a map that had a breakout of acne, all righty, and uh, so it's pretty easy to spot. Chloroplath map, it sounds like I'm clearing my throat when I say chlor <coughs> chloroplath, right? Um, but a chloroplath map really is a colored map. Um, now, it's not just any colors, there's a theme to it. So what you do is you, whatever you're measuring, um, you divide it into categories based on its frequency. Um, and then for that area, you assign it a color. And generally, whatever you're measuring, if there's a greater frequency of what you're measuring in that area, it's a darker color. Um, and then the less and the less of that variable, 
uh, in other places, you assign those lighter colors. So it's going to lead to a pattern where there's going to be dark colors on the map indicating, yeah, there's a lot of whatever it is we're measuring there, all the way down to a light color or maybe even white, uh, which would mean obviously there's very little or none of what we are looking for in that area. It can be anything that you're measuring, right? Here's a presidential election. Um, and they're measuring like what percentage of each state voted for a particular candidate. So like the, the ones that are really dark red, almost like maroonish color, those voted overwhelmingly for a Republican candidate, right? In I want to say 2008. Those that are very dark blue, like California, they voted overwhelmingly for the uh, Democratic candidate. And then you'll notice there are lighter blues. Well, that means they still voted Democrat, but a fewer percentage did, and so the majority wasn't as high, right? Uh, and then you get to kind of these yellow areas as well. These yellow areas uh, would be states that uh, voted Republican, uh, but were almost like 50-50. They barely voted Republican. So again, looking at the color scheme, deep red all the way up to light yellow. So deep red means the highest frequency. Orange means middle frequency. Uh, yellow means the lightest frequency or the lowest number of frequency in that area. Similarly, look at the blues. Deep blue, medium blue, light blue indicating what percentage of the population voted for that candidate, all right? Uh, here's population per square mile by state, right? So some, some states have a larger population per square mile. California, Illinois, Ohio, for example, they're dark blue, right? And that indicates that there's over 1,000 people per square mile in that state, all the way up to these states that are very light blue, the lightest blue, only 0 to 20 people per square mile in those states. Nobody's there. All right, I wonder why people would not want to live in Wyoming. Hmm. Uh, this is a really famous chloropleth map, right? Uh, when you look at a soft drink, like a Coke, what do you call it? Well, depending on where you live, you're going to call it different things. And this map is showing you that in the northern United States, they tend to call it pop. In the south, they call it Coke. In the west, they call it soda. And the color of your county indicates what percentage of people in your county use that term. So for instance, deep blue, right, colors, in those counties, almost everybody says pop, right? Uh, when I grew up, I called soda pop. Um, that's kind of a northern sort of thing. All right, I'm interested in what these others are. I wonder what these other people call their Coke. That's what I'd like to know. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. I don't think we need it. So, hey, we're looking at population density, the number of people per square mile. We can choose which thematic map we want to use. We could use a dot map, right, and every one of those dots is going to indicate a place uh, that has 100,000 people. Uh, or we could use a chloropleth map and just say, hey, the areas that are darkest have the highest population density. The areas that are lightest have the lowest. All right. Next map style, proportional symbol. All right, sometimes called graduated symbol. I'm sure many of you are looking to graduate at the end of the year. Uh, hopefully that'll help you remember the other word for this map. So it's a map where we're measuring some variable, right? And we're going we're gonna to assign it a symbol. And um, that symbol is either going to be larger or smaller in a place, depending on how frequent that variable is. So this map is Walmart's in the United States, right? And the areas that, ha and we're measuring with a circle, that's our graduated symbol. Um, and so uh, you look at the places that have large circles, that means they have a larger number of Walmarts. You look at the places that have very small circles, right? That means they have very few. So it's an easy way to compare places using the same symbol, no matter what it is. Here's motor vehicle deaths. Same information, but I can display it in two different ways, right? I can display it as a circle here, right? And that would be my proportional symbol, a circle. Or uh, we want to make it a little bit more personal, we can make the symbol a automobile. It doesn't matter what the symbol is, as long as you are using it for every area, right, that you are measuring and just making it larger or smaller depending on what it is. I love this one. Number of hunting licenses per state. Look at that. Those are bucks or deer or whatever that's supposed to be. Um, and you can see the places that have larger hunting licenses. What can we assume? Those are places that probably have larger numbers of gun owners as well, right? Um, because, well, most of the time you need a gun in order to hunt unless you're using a, another form of um, hunting weaponry. All right, cows and cattle in Maryland. I'm sure this is something you always wondered about, right? Look at the counties in Maryland. What a weird-looking state. And, uh, you know, some of them have lots of moo cow, right? Mega cow. Others, uh, little baby cow, right? And that just means we can assume 
Places that have smaller numbers probably are more urban. They're probably less agricultural, right? And places that have large numbers, those are probably the agricultural areas of the state, or at least the livestock areas. So again, proportional symbol, pretty cool. Uh, let's go to an isoline map. An isoline map uses contour lines. It measures the frequency of something. Um, it oftentimes is used to measure temperature, elevation in a particular place, all right? So these are sometimes hard to read. They love to put them on weather forecasts. They love to use them to measure uh, elevation as well. So what this is saying is, hey, in, in, inside this circle right here, everything is 95 degrees, right? I don't know that. It doesn't say that 100%, but I can look at the color and see that's what it's saying, 100 degrees or 95 degrees, all right? Then... Everything in this area, right, that is shaded this color, on average, averages 90 degrees per day. And then if we keep going, now in this area, right, within these lines, this lighter red color, everything there averages 85 degrees per day. And then so on and so forth, there's 80, there's 75, there's 70, there's 65. So you can really look at the climate of the United States, at the temperature of the United States, right, and see, oh my goodness, some places are 30 to 40 degrees hotter um, than other places in the United States, and you can specifically see exactly where with a contour map. Now, this map is going to change probably from day to day, obviously, because temperatures do, right? So contour maps oftentimes... Um, almost might look like they're moving from day to day because they're not going to have the same contours every single time. Weather people love contour maps. This is air pressure, right? So you see this on the news during the weather forecast sometimes. And it's just basically telling you what the air pressure is, right? Uh, if it's above 1,000, those are generally high air pressures. If it's below 1,000, those are low. Um, and so it's kind of telling you where it is higher pressure versus low because we can kind of predict where storms are going to take place as a... Uh, results. All right, I'm going to skip over this one and get to flow line. Isoline and flow line, don't confuse them. They're two different things. A flow line map is pretty easy. You're going to have lines with arrows on them, and they're going to display the movement or the flow of something, whether it's people, whether it's objects, from one location to another. The wider or larger the arrow, the more flow or movement there is. The smaller or skinnier the arrow, arrow obviously, the less movement or flow there is going to be. Right, so here we can see a map of immigration into the United States in 2007, and as you can see, we're getting immigrants from um, some areas in larger numbers than other. Asia and uh, North America, right? Um, we're getting larger numbers. Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, much fewer. Uh, here's natural gas flows in the United States in the 1960s. Where was the oil, the natural gas being, um, you know? Uh, taken out of Earth, and where was it being distributed? So it's coming out of places like Texas, and it's being shipped to the Northeast, like New York, because that's where a lot of folks were living. All right, let's get to a cartogram. Cartogram is a thematic map uh, where a theme is substituted for the mass of the area. It can often result in really, ma in really bloated or stretched looking maps. They're really easy to spot. When you see them, you know right away it's a cartogram. Um, <laughs> like this is a map of the world, right, and their population. But the cartogram has taken the land mass of countries and it's either made them much fatter or skinnier depending on how much of the world's population they have. So India and China have together almost half of the world's population. So their land masses have been bloated or exaggerated massively to demonstrate the fact that so many people in the world live there. Look at Canada. Canada is a huge country, but it's only got 30 million people. So to reflect that, this cartogram has completely minimized the size of Canada to reflect that it really is only responsible for a very small number of the people on Earth's surface. All right, so pretty cool map to look at. Uh, and you can really see, well, hey, people are not evenly distributed. They are spread all over. Love this, too. You look at that thing, it almost looks like a bug to me, right, with, like, wings back here and stuff. Uh, this is actually a map of the United States. It's showing mountaineering accidents, so mountain climbing, rock climbing accidents per year. Um, and so obviously some states, California, Washington, Wyoming, Colorado, they tend to have a huge number. Meanwhile, the Great Plains, almost none, because let's face it, there's not really any mountains in the Great Plains region. So why would they have mountaineering accidents? Nobody's going to go mountaineering there, right? Uh, Wyoming, Colorado, California, Washington, huge mountain ranges, and they attract mountain uh, climbers and rock climbers. And so this cartogram is showing you where a majority of those accidents are taking place. You draw the conclusions based on the map that is provided to you. Here's a measure of the economy in the 1990s. 
which countries were really big uh, contributors, who were responsible for most of the world's wealth production. Uh, and the United States, Japan, China, all look really good here. Look at Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So much of Africa is not even displayed here because their GDP is so low it doesn't even register to be calculated on this particular map. This is from the 90s. If we looked at it today, Japan would probably be smaller. China would be larger, obviously, to reflect um, changes that have occurred in modern times with Chinese production. Now, finally, mental, cognitive maps. Mental maps are not always printed. Maps aren't always printed. Everybody has a mental map. You have it in your mind all the time. You've developed it year, over years and years, uh, looking at wall maps, atlases, books, magazines, newspapers. You also have maps of your own home, mental maps of your own home. I guarantee if you stand up right now with your eyes closed, you're going to be able to navigate around your home pretty well because in your brain you already have uh, the layout, the geography of your home or your apartment or whatever in your mind, right? We do this all the time. We have mental maps for our homes, neighborhoods, any place that we go to regularly. Uh, some of us have more detailed ones than others, right? Um, but let's face it, people's perceptions of a place, of a region, they're totally influenced by your mental map, by your own perception and your own beliefs, not just the physical map that you're looking at, right? If I asked you to draw a map of your, from walking from your home to your school, um, it's very likely that many of you may have the same um, path or go the same way. But each person is probably going to highlight or accentuate different features, right? Oh, that church right there is going to be highlighted on this student's map because they go there all the time. So it's a part of their mental map. Uh, whereas a kid that doesn't go there, right, uh, but likes to go to the park and skateboard, right, that's going to be an area that's really going to be important to them. It's probably going to find its way on their drawn mental map. Um, so again, uh, mental maps vary from people to people, but we can take mental maps and put them together and really understand the perceptions that people have in a particular location. This is a typical college student's mental map. This was a professor who did this in class on the first day of his geography, and he took uh, what he considered to be a sample response. And like, look at how like terribly drawn this is. Like, everything's kind of accurate in terms of its location, but none of it's really accurate in terms of land area, size, and things like that. This person did it straight from their memory. They had no map they were referencing. They were just doing it off of what they remembered. And all in all, I think that's a fairly good job. All right? It also shows you, listen, people know certain countries, certain areas, but like South America is just South America. They couldn't differentiate it any further. Look at, look at um, Africa. The only thing these people can differentiate is Egypt and South Africa. The rest of the continent is just a blob to them. And you'll notice spelling and things like that is off as well. Uh, this is a guy mental map of, um, of a, uh, a city, right? It's an overhead view of a city. Um, and I think, without knowing more, I could be wrong on this, I think there might have been like some rioting or activity or something like that that was going on, and he was kind of drawing his memory of it. Here's a student's mental map from the first day that I had them draw a few years ago. I mean, it's right, right? But, I mean, it lacks incredible detail, and it's generally right, but it lacks incredible detail. Um, and, again, if I asked each person to do this, I'm, I would get different maps. Uh, they would all look a little bit different, but they would all have some common similarities as well. Hopefully you would know, for instance, where North America is on Earth. This is a funny American mental map. This is making fun of American stereotypes of the rest of the world. Um, it's a little dated, right? But it, it kind of goes to show you that perceptions really affect your understanding of geography, right? So here's us, Canada, Mexico, right? South America, what most Americans, when they said heard South America, the first things they thought of were those two things, right? Here, when you talk Europe, those are the first things that came to mind. Africa, right? Uh, they have a color like a zebra because a lot of people remember like, oh, there's African safari animals, but they don't know any difference. They don't know any specifics. Uh, Russia, they call it the Russian mob, right? Because that's what most Americans associated with Russia at the time. Oil and war, that's the Middle East, right? Uh, and then Nike factory in India, Microsoft factory in China and Southeast Asia. Radioactive because of that earthquake in Japan, right? Don't go here. That's supposed to be North Korea, uh, but it's not really located where it ought to be. All right, and then, of course, there's this big island over here. Hawaii, Americans are asking? No, that's actually Australia. All right. Anyway, so it's supposed to be a funny way of looking at American mental maps. All right, folks, hey, that's it. Those are your map types. You're going to need to know each of those thematic types. Um, you're going to need to know those historic maps as well. And what I want you to do next, 
I want you to go to the next part of this assignment and I want you to take the practice map quiz. And I want you to go through it as many times as you need to until you're comfortable in identifying these various types of maps. One last thing, remember, as you're covering this video slash these slides, you need to be filling out the Google form, right, where you're indicating what each of these maps are, right, and how you can distinguish them, how you can differentiate them, how you can identify them by sight, because that's going to be one of your first tasks in a quiz. Anyways, Mr. M, signing off. I am super excited about AP Human this year, e-learning. We are going to rock it. You are going to love this class, uh, and I'm going to love you for taking it. Folks, signing off here. Let me know if you have any questions. M-A-J-E-W-S-K-I underscore M-A at A-U-H-S-D dot U-S. I can't wait to chat with you all on Monday.